want to ask you, do you guys uh, know who Benjamin Kyle is? You ever, you ever heard of Benjamin Kyle? If you're from uh, Richmond Hill, Georgia, you might have heard of this guy. Uh, Benjamin Kyle was an alias chosen by an American man who had uh, a severe case of disassociative amnesia. This guy was found without clothes or identif- without clothing or identification with injuries uh, next to a dumpster behind a fast food restaurant in Georgia in 2004. It was actually August 31st, 2004, at 5 a.m., uh, a Burger King employee in Richmond Hill, Georgia, found him unconscious, sunburned, and naked behind a dumpster of uh, the fast food restaurant. He had three depressions on his skull that appeared to have been caused by blunt force trauma, and he was covered in red ant bites on his body. That's a bad situation. As a result of all this stuff, he, uh, he lacked personal memories. Between 2004 to 2015, neither he nor the authorities were sure of his real identity or his background, despite searches uh, with nationwide television, uh, tons of different methods that were used. They were unable to figure out who he was until 2015, Uh, through genetic detective work that had been going on for several years, they found out who he really was. His name was William Burgess Powell. Although part of uh, his missing years, history still remains untraceable. He has, uh, even though they found out who his identity is, I mean, the guy still doesn't know who he is. Uh, The one good thing about finding his identity is he no longer had to depend on money under the table from doing jobs. He was able to get assistance Uh, once they discovered a social security number for him. I mean, I was reading the story about this guy, and I started thinking to myself, and I've I've read many stories about people that this has happened to, and for some reason, in a weird way, it intrigues me, and I'm wondering, how does this stuff happen? I mean, can you imagine for a minute if you woke up tomorrow naked behind a dumpster of a fast food restaurant, and you didn't know who you were, but you were covered with ant bites, your head was beat in. I mean, that's a bad situation to be in. You have no idea who your family is. You have no idea who you are. I mean, that is as scary as anything I can imagine. Now, when, when we think about something like that, some of us go, wow, man, that's, that's crazy. And we, we, we can't even really wrap our mind around the idea of that kind of amnesia and not knowing who we are. Some of us might go, I wish that kind of would happen in my life, right? And we look at that, and none of us have ever experienced anything like that. But I will tell you that many of us have uh, experienced something similar to that from a spiritual perspective. Something happens in life, difficulty comes, and we wake up and we forget who we are. We don't forget who our family is. We don't forget our name, but we forget our identity. For being a pastor for many years now, one of the things that I've counseled people on and had many conversations about and and helped people on the journey on is they, they lose their identity. They forget who they truly are. Now, I gave you an extreme example of this guy who literally lost his identity and has no idea who he is, but That's where a lot of us find ourselves spiritually today. We don't have disassociative amnesia, but we do have spiritual amnesia. We're wondering, who am I? I want to ask you that question today as you think about your life. Do you know who you are? I'm not asking you, do you know your social security number or your your name or your parents, but do you truly know who you are or have you forgotten who you are in Christ? I believe almost all of us end up finding ourselves in some really bad situations, making some really bad decisions when we forget our identity, when we forget who we are in Christ. If you find yourself in that spot today in a list of bad decisions or in a difficult situation or you've made some bad choices along the way, if you look back and you trace it back in your life, I guarantee you it started with forgetting who you are. It started with losing that identity of who God has called you to be and who you truly are in him. Our big truth today that I encourage you to remember is this. Who we are determines what we do, and what we do reveals who we really are. I want to read it again. Who we are determines what we do, 
And what we do reveals, reveals who we really are. You see, it's out of who we are that we act. And, 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 and the way that we live ultimately reveals who we are. Spiritual amnesia is when we say something but yet do another. We claim, oh, I, I'm devoted to Jesus. I'm committed to Jesus. I, I love God, but yet our life is reflecting something different. We're not living out the identity that has been given to us by God. You see, I believe that God's desire is for us to understand truly who we are in him. And I think some of it is a misunderstanding of who we are. And I hope to clear some of that up today. And, and I hope you walk out of here today with a better understanding of who God says you are so that you can walk in confidence in, in, in what Christ has done and who you are in him and to live the life that you've been called to live. Because if you can't do that, you can't move forward. You will remain spiritually stuck if you don't know who you are in Jesus. If you don't understand all that God has done for you and what that means for your standing with God and for your purpose in your life. The last two weeks we've been talking about purpose. And this is such an important piece to this because if we don't understand our identity, we can't live out the purpose that God has for us. We just continue to spin the wheels of our life and we remain stuck and we can't get any traction. So I wanna ask you again, who are you? Today, have you lost yourself? Remember when you first started following Jesus? I want you to think about that right now. Think about back to that point. If you're a Jesus follower, I want you to think back to that point. When you first met Jesus, you remember how aggressive you were? I mean, you would do anything he told you to do. You'd jump off the mountain. You'd, you'd give everything you had. You'd risk anything. You'd tell everybody. You'd sell what you had so that people could know Jesus. But you know, life has happened. We've become comfortable. We've embraced spiritual amnesia, and we have forgotten what God has done in us and for us, and we have forgotten who we are. It's, it happens in my life. It happens in your life. It happens in all of our lives on the journey. We forget who we are. And God is calling us to remember, remember who he is, remember what he's done for us. Remember what you would do for him when you first met him. What happened? What happened between then and now? I was reading some, I think it was Tim Keller said, the greatest threat to Christianity is not atheism, it's complacent Christians. It's not atheism, I'm not scared of that. I'm more concerned about people who claim the name of Jesus who are sitting back in their recliner, not living by faith, not trusting God, not doing and living out the identity that they claim. Who are you? Have you lost yourself? We all go through those seasons, I know I have, where I forget who I am. I have spiritual amnesia. I used to embrace this radical faith of following Jesus anywhere, but now I've adopted this safe Christianity where I just put God in my box, and as long as it fits in what I want, then I'm okay with you, Jesus. But once you tell me to step outside of that, I'm just gonna ignore you. I'm gonna kinda just forget what you say, put my fingers in my ear, not pay attention to what you're calling me to. You, you guys get me? You live where I do? I think we all struggle with that. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, in James chapter one, he talks about hearing what God says and forgetting and not doing what his word says. And I want us to look at these verses today. James chapter one, we're gonna look through 21 through 25, but I first wanna look at verse 21 and 22. It says this, James writes and he says, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Pretty simple here, right? You gotta remove the junk out of your life. If you know it's moral filth, get it out of there, do whatever it takes, remove it from your life, because it's so prevalent. Like, we don't have to look very far, right? I mean, it's all around us. It's, it's extremely accessible and available to all of us. Get rid of it and humble yourself. Humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive, your, deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, here's the amazing thing about God. We were just saying, God, you're so good. You're so good. I'm going to just explain to you one of the ways that God is good. You may be going, well, man, everything's not working out the way I want it to. So I don't know about that song. I don't know about that statement. But here's one of the ways that God is incredibly good to us is that God, on the journey of life, he uses people to plant seeds of his word in our lives. 
Right now, today, my goal is not to change anybody's life. My goal is simply to plant seeds. I can't save you. I can't change you. God can do that. But I'm a seed planter. And and we are all called to be planting those seeds. And along the journey, God, he plants those seeds through people, through situations, through circumstances, through hardship, through good times. I can go down the list and he plants those seeds in our lives of his word. But we must recognize his goodness and we must humble ourselves and receive this word. This good word that he gives us is the message of Jesus. That is what can save you. James says it right there, the word planted in you is talking about the gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus, which can save you. Do not not merely listen to the word. You know, you can hear about Jesus uh, till you're, you know, blue in the face. But until you humbly receive what's been planted in you, you're just deceiving yourselves. You got to do what it says. You got to act upon what Christ has done on your behalf. He goes on in James chapter 1, verse 23 through 25, and he gives this example of someone who has spiritual amnesia. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, none of us did that today. You looked in the mirror, hopefully, before you came and at least wiped your face off, you know? You got it together a little bit. And when you walked away, you didn't immediately forget what you looked like. If somebody showed you a picture of yourself, you'd go, yeah, that's me, I I see that. But that's the way we are spiritually so often. We're, We're like men who look at our face in the mirror and then we immediately walk away and we forget what we look like. We forget what the word of God says. We forget who it says we are in Christ. Verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Now, I just want to pause there for a minute because the perfect law that gives freedom is he's talking about the message of Christ. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is very aware of the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law is not a law that gives freedom. It is a law that reveals sin and the need for freedom. But Jesus is the one who came, born of a virgin, the birth that you couldn't be born of, and lived the life, the sinless life that you and I couldn't live, and he kept the laws of God perfectly, something that's impossible for man to do in and of himself. And then he died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected on the third day. That's what gave us the perfect law that gives freedom. What Christ did, that's the perfect law. The good news of Jesus Christ And James is saying, you need to look intently into what Jesus has done for you, and you need to receive it because it gives freedom, and you need to continue in it, not forgetting what you've heard. Don't just hear the good news of Christ and go, well, that's really great. I like that, and then forget about it. No, it needs to take deep root into your heart and into your soul, and it must transform you and change you. And then he goes on and says, they will be blessed in what they do. So often we forget. We hear the word of God. We know the truth about the word of God. We know what it says about who we are in Christ, but we forget. We have spiritual amnesia. We forget what God has done for us. We forget who we are in Christ. It's not what you do for Christ. It's who you are in Christ. Did you know over 140 references that say in Christ, through Christ, by Christ? It is in Christ, it is through Christ, it is by Christ that we are made right with God. That is the law that brings freedom and we must understand this so that we can move forward. You must understand who you are because if you're operating in some religiosity that you bring to the table, you're gonna continue to hit a dead end road. But once you understand that this this free gift of life is offered to you and when you receive it, it transforms you, it changes you. It gives you freedom, it gives you hope, it gives you purpose, it gives you a new identity. So let me ask you, who are you? Have you truly received the gift of Christ? Has your identity been changed by Jesus? Because it's in that identity that we actually live purpose. You see, you can be looking for purpose all day long, but until your identity is changed and you're made right with God, you're searching for an impossible purpose. Purpose is only found when your identity is changed in what Jesus Christ has done for you. Who we are determines what we do, and and what we do reveals who we truly are. So who are you today? You see, 
The Bible tells us that Satan, the enemy, wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've told you guys this before, but I want to remind you that Satan wants to steal your identity. If you think about how you ended up where you are right now, and you're discouraged and frustrated about where you are, you didn't just jump into that. It started first with an eroding of your identity. God told you who you are in Jesus, but the enemy started deceiving you, making you believe less about God, making you believe that what Jesus has done is not enough, making you believe that your standing with God is based on how well you perform. And over time, your, your, your identity in Christ started to erode. And then after the enemy steals our identity, he kills your relationship. He kills your relationship with people, but he kills your relationship with God because if he can, if he can erode your identity in who you are in Jesus, then it starts to undermine the relationship that you have with God. You start to question God. I had a conversation last week um, with a young man, and he was telling me about a friend, and he said, man, my friend is really questioning God because, man, they, they, they trusted God with several things, and it just didn't turn out the way that, they thought it should or the way they wanted it to. And it, this goes back, and I, and I repeated the same thing to him that I said two weeks ago. And, and I believe this is so true because this has been a sin in my life. And I believe it's true in all of our lives. Check this out. This is what we do. So here we are in America, right? And we all have an, an idea of what we think it means to be successful and what we deserve in America. I, you know, I deserve a good job. I deserve a house. I deserve good health. I deserve all these things, right? And so we, we create this idea in our mind of what it means to be successful and what we deserve. And then what we do is we put that on God. And we put it on God's word. And if it doesn't work out the way we think it ought to with our American formed mindset of what we believe should be, then we blame God. But God never said, I'm going to give you everything that, that, that the American dream promises. You see, we're putting things on God that God never promised. And so then we're getting ticked off at God and blaming God for stuff that we shouldn't be ticked off and blaming God for. It's really jacked up. And I've done this over and over in my life. And then I go, wow, that's really messed up. You know what that reveals in my heart? It actually reveals that I want to be God and I want God to be my servant. Right? I really want to be the God here. But when I step back and I understand really what it's all about, God doesn't promise me all the things that the American world tells me that I deserve and that I put on him. God has given me everything I need through Christ Jesus. Everything else is just icing on the cake and a bonus. I can't explain why some people have more and some people have less. That's God's business. But I can tell you this, don't blame God because you don't get everything you want. Because the thing that God may be keeping from you is the thing he needs to keep from you to form you and to make you into who God wants you to be because you never accomplish the purpose that God has for you if he gives you what you want because you'll just kick back and relax. And God wants to do more in you and stir something in you. It's, it's, it's something that really has been challenging me because, guys, I'm, I'm the worst at this. I mean, I am the worst. If it doesn't work out, if the building's not full, if the money's not rolling in, come on, God, you're letting me down here. What's up, God? I thought you called me to do this. Where are you at, God? But maybe God's called me to struggle. Maybe God wants to form me and shape me and make me. Maybe God wants to do that in you. Because maybe God's more concerned about my character than he is about my comfort. Have you lost yourself? I think we all have those tendencies where we get caught up and we lose our identity. And the enemy, he wants to steal your identity. He wants to erode that identity of who God's called you to be. He wants to kill the relationship that you have with the Lord. And ultimately, he destroys your purpose. Right now, some of you are going, I don't have any purpose. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know what's going on. I want you to backtrack. Back up. You're, at, you're asking the wrong question. You're saying, I don't know what my purpose is. Step back and go, okay, do I understand who I am in Jesus? 
Has my identity been eroded? Has my identity and the things I've put on God not been the things I should have put on God? Is my relationship with God in tune? Am I, am I being God or am I letting God be God? And then from there, your purpose will start to be clarified. And so I just want to get real practical today. I want to give you three essentials for knowing who you are because I'm just telling you guys, these, these are critical for me. I am a type A, highly driven, I don't stop, I'm like a motor. I mean, there's not enough accomplishment to satisfy me. And that's a problem. It's a problem, it can eat your soul away. And so these are just three practical things that the Bible teaches that help me not lose my mind. Okay, so I hope they help you not lose your mind either. Number one, the first essential for knowing who you are is to share the good news with yourself daily. Now, I told you guys that 10 times in sermons. It's not because I can't come up with something else. It's because I believe it's that important. I tell you guys that all the time, probably once a month or almost that much, because I believe it's that important. Remember, don't forget. We're, we, we forget so quickly. Right? If this thing doesn't work out exactly, I forget what God did uh, last month. Oh, that blessing's behind me, God. I need some more. You know, I want it to happen now. Microwave this thing, God. The microwave, I believe, has messed our head up. But anyway. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 and 14, Paul writes to the church in, in Ephesus, and I love this first word. He says, remember. There's something important about remembering. Remember. Now I want you to put yourself in this verse, and I want you to understand this. Remember that you were at a time separated from Christ. Do you remember that? If you don't, maybe you still are. If you don't remember that, maybe you still are, because I remember. Do you remember before you knew Jesus? You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of the promise? having no hope and without God in the world. Now, he's writing to the church in Ephesus who were Gentiles, who were separated from the grace and mercy of God until Jesus came, which is what he says in verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by your good works and effort, by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's through the cross, by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself, check this out, is our peace. Jesus is your peace, not you, for he himself is our peace. He is the one that has made us right, for he has made uh, both one and has uh, broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There was a barrier between us and God, and he has removed that barrier by what he has done for us, and he has given us hope. I want you to remind yourself today of your true identity, of what Jesus has done for you about who you are in him. So often we build up our image on what we've accomplished rather than who we are in Christ. I'll tell you guys, if attendance is really good, if the offering is really good, I'll feel really good about myself tomorrow. If it stinks, I'll feel like a loser. That's a problem, right? We're all that way, though. We base our, our emotional standing with God on our performance. And, and that is eroding my identity in Christ and affecting my relationship because when I feel that way, I don't want to spend time with God. He let me down. You know, we all do this in our own different ways. And ultimately, that's the work of the enemy going, you dummy, you're playing right into my hand, which I am pretty dumb. I'm from Mississippi. I mean, you know? It's amazing I got out of school. I'm just kidding. We're smarter than Alabama. But anyway, back to the sermon. You got to share the good news with yourself every day. The second thing you got to do, not only re remind yourself of what God has done for you and who you were before you met Jesus, but the second thing is rest in his finished work. Rest in the finished work of Jesus. You see, I kind of already said this, but I don't find my, my worth in what I do. But when you're a highly driven type A person, you typically do. There's some people in here that are in sales, and at the end of the month, if you had a great month in sales, you feel worth. If you don't, you feel like garbage. If your kids are doing good, you feel good. If they're not, you feel like garbage. You see, we're basing our identity on, on circumstantial things, and that's just not right. 
I'm not saying you need to be a, a zombie and not have emotion. We all have emotion, but we know we have to know how to manage that based on what Jesus says and who we are in him. And so I have to rest in what Christ has done and what he has finished. And my standing with God this week will not be based on how good this sermon is or how bad it is. It will be based on what Christ did on the cross. 1 Peter 1.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness by his wounds. We have been healed, not by what I've done. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, it says this, Now it is God... Don't miss that. It is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. It's God. It is God who makes us stand firm. He anointed us, verse 22, he set his seal of ownership on us. He set his seal of ownership on us. What is that? And he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Let me tell you something, it's guaranteed. He has put his, he, he has branded you as his child. He has deposited his spirit inside of you. And that deposit is a guarantee. There is no uh, thing, nothing's going to come back uh, from a bad return. It is a deposit guaranteeing your salvation in Jesus Christ. That is who you are. Now, we must live our lives and walk in the confidence of Jesus Christ. We boast, as Charles said earlier, not in what we've done. We boast in the cross. I don't rest in my work, I rest in the finished work of Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary, and you'll find rest in him. The third thing you gotta do, not only share the gospel, good news with yourself every day, and rest in the finished work of Jesus, but every day give thanks for your new identity. Give thanks. I am awesome at complaining and not giving thanks. I mean, if there was somebody who could be a professional complainer, I could be that. Some of y'all could too. I've talked to you a few times. I'm just kidding. No, but we do. We live in, in the state of complaint and negativity rather than going, thank you, God. I mean, this world may fall apart. Who knows what's going to happen? We don't know. You do understand we live in a broken world, right? That's why Jesus came to rescue us. We live in a broken world. And in the brokenness and negativity that surrounds us, we can either be engulfed into that or we can step back from it and give thanks for who we are in Jesus. Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. Now, I don't want you to get the big head, but you are. You're God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in, there it is again, in Christ Jesus. Why, why has he created us anew? So that you can be awesome. No, he created us anew, and he says it next, so we can do the good works, good things he has planned for us long ago. We don't do the good things to become anew. We've been made anew to do the good things. See, part of living in your identity is is living out this truth that is real about you, living out this good news. When the identity of Jesus is applied to someone, they become his masterpiece. They become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Will you give thanks for who you are and who God says you are? It is out of that place of thankfulness that we honor God, that we live lives of surrender, that we remind ourselves every day of what he's done, that we rest in his finished work, and that we give thanks. I want to end the service a little different. I I just want you to sit there for a minute and just think about your life right now. I want you to just spend a moment reflecting. And I want you to think about your identity in Jesus. The first thing I want you to do is is the team leads us is I want you just to remind yourself of what God has done for you. Remind yourself of who you were before you met him. Remind yourself. The second thing I want you to do is I want to encourage you. I've got a timer going on. I want, I want to encourage you to really rest in the finished work of what Jesus has done. Rest in that finished work of what Jesus has done. And the third thing, I want you to give thanks for your new identity. 
As you, as you sit there and you reflect, as we respond to the Lord, I just wanna encourage you to do that. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your good news. It changes our lives. It gives us hope. Lord, help us not to operate and to live in what we do, but let us live out of who we are in you. Help us to work out of that rest. Help us to serve you out of our true identity, not to serve to get something, but because of what we've been given, Lord. In each of our lives this week, we will struggle in some kind of way as it pertains to this message. And so, Lord, help us to be reminded of what your word says and what it reminds us of who we are in you. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you have done in my life. I thank you for what you've done in so many. I pray right now for those who do not know you. Lord, you're revealing to them who they are right now. I pray that they would say yes to you. I say that they would come and receive the help that you offer. Lord, if you're stirring in their heart, <laughs> you're gonna keep doing that. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd lead them to yourself. I ask this in Jesus' name.